Okay, so uh, we were talking about you. You you were talking about the assassination of Whitney Houston, and and how if you go back, maybe even through Google Earth, you will see that it's right by the all-seeing eye of the fountain, and this pyramid tri triangle showing that uh, that that there are these occult elements that it's actually an occult ritual assassination uh, uh, it, it, consistent with uh, 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 the takeover of the Illuminati uh, a system of the music industry. Parenthetically, I'd just like to, to say that by office, the Grand Master of the Freemasons in the UK is Prince Edward, a member of the royal family. That's officially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this goes up to the British throne, mm -hmm. to the largest landowner on the planet that owns 26% of the planet, and that is the head of state of, you know, multiple countries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's built into the whole how how the planet runs. I tell you, the British royal family are deeply involved in all of this. The whole shebang. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're let let's let, we're we're now in this special program covering the assassination of musicians, uh, uh, and we've covered. Uh, uh, in 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 part one, we've covered the assassination of John Lennon and of Bob Marley, uh, two two very high <coughs> souls who were taken from us, and now we're coming to the assassination of Whitney Houston. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Normally, I try to avoid these ritualistic uh, things because as soon as you start talking about that, many people go like, yeah, well, well, it's too much, you know, it's too weird. And uh, she just died from an overdose or she drowned in the bathtub and so on. But <laughs> once you start looking into it, it's very hard to deny that something very, very strange was going on. And uh, this is uh, what I would like to, to start talking about. Because... Uh, also, if you start to see strategically, if you see that there's, then suddenly things start making sense instead of it just being, uh, uh, um, like the official story, as far as I know, is that uh, she took uh, she took a bit of an overdose of medicine and uh, took a, a bath, and then she drowned in the bath. <clears throat> The official story is also that she came to she had she had rented several rooms uh, in Beverly Hilton Hotel because uh, th this very day she had come a day or two earlier, but she came there because Clive Davis, who was the guy who found her, who discovered her, and brought her through her whole career, who's also a very central figure in not so very nice things in this music industry. It was uh, his pre-Grammy party was going uh, to be held in the ballroom downstairs in the same, very same hotel. Her room was for, uh, room 434 uh, on the fourth uh, floor in this uh, Beverly Hilton Hotel. And the official story says that she came to the hotel room about 2.30 uh, in the afternoon and that she was found about an hour later in the bathtub and that she was dead by then. Okay, so if you start looking at, at uh, what witnesses and so on actually saw, was that, or what was written straight after, you, you, you always have to, to check out what is said directly after one of, uh, su uh, such an event here, because as soon as uh, the longer the time goes, you know, a week or, or two down the line, Suddenly, witnesses don't talk anymore. Articles have disappeared. Uh, reporters have been shut down, and so on. So it's very important to be right on the case when it happens. And here, it came up on that they had pulled out her body of the bathtub, and it was already cold. This is an hour after she was alive officially, 
and her, co her body was cold in a hot bathtub. So here I come with my Farmer Brown logic. There's something very strange going on here because you cannot die and be dead in hot water and then be cold within one hour. It takes hours for the body to cool down, to at least an hour to get to, especially not in hot water. Also, she was found with her head under the water and her legs uh, up against the wall. So it, almost like she was pulled, pressed down under and held under the water until she died. Okay, so one very strange thing was that her her daughter, Bobby Christine, who was, uh, who was um, uh, 18 at the time, she almost died identically, uh, Bobby Christina, the day before. And what happened was that uh, she took a bath and uh, after a while, one of her friends and started knocking on the door, but she didn't open up, so she called for security in the end, and they, they opened the door and went in, and she was like almost unconscious in, in the bathtub. But they, they got her out, and they, she, she was saved. Then I, the same identical event happens the very next day, but this time to her mother. Once again, big question mark. How big are the chances for an identical thing to happen in the same uh, apartment, you know, again. So there's quite a lot of, of evidence pointing towards that there was some kind of drink there, maybe champagne or something that was laced with some kind of drug to, uh, to calm them down or to make them unconscious or, or so on. And I will also, now we're talking about drugs, I just want to mention that the drugs that was found in uh, near the bathtub and so on, came from the same chemist as the ones that were found when uh, Michael Jackson died, uh, the Mickey Freak uh, chemist in Los Angeles. And also one thing that I would like to point out is that when you look into many of these big cases, they have happened in Los Angeles. So if there's a good place, if, I'm not saying that the police is super corrupt there, I think so, but uh, then you would pick Los Angeles to be the perfect spot because then you would have your people there already that have been part in many of the other cases that could be help you to cover the whole thing up. We're talking Marilyn Monroe, O.J. Simpson, Robert Kennedy, many of the film stars and so on. Okay, so uh, the night before uh, we're talking like Bobby Christina first. She was saved in the, uh, the day before. Then in the middle of the night, there about 2.30 in the morning, the person who was staying at the, in the room underneath, on the third floor, underneath the uh, witness room, suddenly uh, there was a, a big, um, uh, what do you call it, leakage. There was water coming from the bathroom uh, above. It was coming down through the to, through the ceiling, so he called security and said, "My God, what is going on here?" Because it, the water was just pumping down. So he and the security guy went up, and this uh, uh, guy from the hotel said, "This is Whitney's room, you know." So they opened. There was no one there, but uh, they saw that uh, it was flooded, and then there was a, a, a flat screen TV that was smashed that he noticed. And uh, anyway. They went down, they managed to stop the, the flooding. And if you look at that, uh, why it flooded, if that was part of her actually being killed at that time, because uh, it seems a lot more logical that she died hours and hours before, when you look at the, the body temperature or the, or the corpse and how she was positioned and so on. So. Uh, there's a there's a big chance that she was killed before and not in the bath, maybe in the uh, or drugged in the bed and then uh, drowned in the bathtub. Or who I'm not sure how it was done, but we're going back to these strange or weird things that also happened. Was that she officially died in the afternoon and the party, Clive Davis party, was in the evening. Now, what happened was that the coroner was specifically ordered not to move the body out of the bathtub until after midnight. That is like, that is like eight, nine hours. 
And while the whole music industry, about 800 people, was gathered downstairs, her body was still in the bathtub upstairs. What is that? And this is when you look into these weird rituals that water is one of the things they said is the gateway to the next dimension and also to get the energy from, from somebody dying and so on. I mean, we're talking weird stuff here, but then look at when she died, I mean, if you go into numerology, she died on February 11th, 2012. And that's, for a numerologist, that's uh, super important because it's just zero ones and twos, all of it. And also, when, when you look in, into this case, there's some experts that have done it, and there's so many of these numbers, the room numbers, the, the date, the, the, the day, the time which she was pronounced dead, and all of these things, that just all of it comes down to these ritualistic uh, figures. Anyway, so why did she die on that specific day? Okay, it was, it was numerology, uh, it was a good day for them to do this ritual. But also, it's important to remember who she was. She was the voice, the voice in the world who specialized in love songs. You know, she sold, I think, about 170 million records. One of the major ones was I Will Always Love You which was the one song most wanted on Valentine's Day, which was three days later. You know, so her de dying on that day, just before Valentine's Day, made a massive uh, you know, boost for this record. And also, within half an hour, not even half an hour after she died, Sonny and Apple and Sony is the, the company that Michael Jackson, the, the leadership of Sony, pointed out as being the devils. He named them the devils of the industry. Uh, and uh, Sony and Apple uh, raised, om they more than doubled the price of all her albums within 30 minutes after she died. How did they know? How was this possible to set this whole machine up? Once again, when you look at these things, they're, they're, it's like insider trading. People are aware. You can see that things are going on, and then boom, the hit is done, and they make millions, billions, and, and whatever from it. Also, Ugh. they have just... They have, yeah, I know this it's is sick. Disgusting. It's disgusting. It is disgusting when you look at it. Also, they had just stopped uh, or finished the production of a film uh, called um, Sparkle. That would that was the 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 film about her, Whitney Houston, and her following her her the star in this film was a, a, a woman by the name of a singer uh, by the name of uh, Jennifer Hudson. That Clive Davis, the the evening before she died officially, meaning that it was actually maybe the evening when she died, he was on uh, Piers Morgan's uh, show and he introduced her as the new Whitney, you know, the, the voice, the upcoming uh, thing. Oh, when you look into this, it's sort of like... It's like, uh, it's too much. What, one thought that occurred to me, and I, and I just like to pa pass it by you, that this is in the area of detail, that if the coroner gave the order not to have the body moved out of the tub until midnight. No, one, he, he, he was ordered not, not to. to not, not to move it out, out of mid, uh, mid, yeah. midnight. That would cover the body temperature issue. No, but she was cold in the afternoon. Oh, oh! They had already determined that that. No, they when 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 they dragged her body out of the tub, oh, it was cold. It was cold, and then yeah. he he was ordered to put it back in the tub. Is that he it? was ordered. He was ordered. I don't know if it was left in the tub or in the room. The body was ordered not to leave the hotel. Oh, oh not not to leave the, the hotel. Yeah. Okay. And gotcha. and it says that it, the management and the the security department of the hotel ordered the coroner. Yeah. But but 
it seems like Clive Davis was the one that gave the order to the hotel management that she should be left there. So while yeah. this whole thing was going on and being filmed and yeah. and all of these things, she was lying dead upstairs. It, you know, it, this is a macabre thought, but didn't the mafia used to do big valance, Valentine Day hits? <laughs> There, there was There's, one, the yeah, Valentine yeah, Day shooting. The Valentine Day shooting. You know, so they, they say, oh, let's do a Valentine Day sh a hit on, on, on Whitney and clean up. You know, I mean, they, that's how these lower order brains work. Now, I, I really think it was to, if it was what I think it was, yeah. they strategically planned it three days before Valentine's. No, no, right, so that right. They, so that they could make like an incredible amount of money yeah, on that. Yeah, 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 no, no, right. Also, right. also they, they sold her clothes uh, from uh, the, the bodyguard. And also they, they planned, I don't know if they have already filmed it, but they were pl uh, planning a, a, re, uh, a new edition of the, the bodyguard with this uh, Jennifer Hudson, I think, as a, one of the stars. So they, the whole thing was prepared to... to Reboost the whole Whitney Houston. Um, oh yeah, thing. And now, but her voice at that time was so bad because of drug uh, uh, abuse uh, and, uh, and drug use. yeah, yeah. And also, she and and her husband Bobby Brown had been part of a like a TV soap uh, opera, you know, like a live documentary yeah, where yeah. they were just yeah, making reality. absolute fools of each other. Yeah, yeah And yeah. so her popularity was going straight down the drain. So here was a chance for them to just boom. Uh, make billions out of it just by letting her their die. investment recoup their investment through a ritualistic <laughs> killing right yeah. before Valentine's Day how Hollywood is that I know we are in Hollywood we right right Hollywood. well has has anybody made Whitney Houston the movie <laughs> the assassination of Whitney Houston the movie not the assassination but this the movie about Whitney was this yeah. movie the sparkle yeah now now you want to make a documentary film about these assassinations, correct? I would very much like to make a documentary connecting all of these things because it's once you start seeing how they're connected, yeah. that it's the same power lead behind it, and they've even used the same group of assassins so yeah. many times. Again, we're talking about what some of these assassins that have been taking out about maybe a thousand people. It's like unreal when you yeah. look into it. Yeah. So it's on a scale that is absolutely yeah, yeah. unreal. Absolutely. Now, what do you need to to make that documentary happen? Uh, I'm not happy amateurs. Yeah. I need professional people. Yeah. Really. Uh, there's especially one uh, uh, Australian. Uh, uh, Producer, his name is John Pilger. Yeah. This this man, if I could get in touch with him, yeah, that would be absolutely amazing. Because to come forward with a theory like this, or or present, I wouldn't even call it a theory, but present uh, proven facts in a in a way that could, within a an hour long documentary, could just show the whole picture. That would be. It, I tell you, it could be amazing in the awakening of, of the world because yeah. still to this day, there's so many people that are, that are asleep or, or choose not to to want to see this. And through one of these documentary, if it's on a high profile profile level, a good budget, very well made, yeah. and for instance, with a person like John Pilger, that would be, give the credibility to the whole thing. Then it could really make the impact that it's supposed to. Yeah. To do now, how how could interested uh, uh, filmmakers get hold hold of you? Uh, through my through my website, Light on Conspiracies. That is a perfect way of doing it. Okay. Uh, good. Or or through you, or I mean, uh, yeah, they no, can sure. get my telephone number through you, or yeah. or whatever. And also financing. I, I would also say to, like, um, if people watch the the first part of our uh, interview that we made for a while ago, they will see that I, I put down like thirty years into so many of these big cases, being able to connect them all, which is 
I'm one of the few, as far as I've seen, that has been able to do that. And to do this type of research, it's very, very hard when you have a family to feed. So oh, sure. any, any type of donations or subscription, I have a newsletter uh, subscription that is so, so appreciated. Yeah, yeah. So people can go to lightonconspiracies.com. Yeah, and also my there they can buy my book uh, Coup d'État in Slow Motion, yes. which is a, a, it's a thousand pages uh, where it it covers the the hit of the Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme, but also connects the whole thing with all the different international weapon uh, illegal weapon dealings and many of the other assassinations, and in the end chapters also connects together with the JFK assassination and many or the other. I was just given a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a book deal, a publishing oh. deal in, in the States, but they, they pulled back. I fixed everything and then they pulled back due to technical difficulties, oh. whatever that means. Technical so. difficulties? Well, I wonder what the <laughs> technical difficulties would be. It's like, I, no, due but, to technical but, difficulties. <laughs> No, no I, 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 I know, I, you know, and the, and, the, and the publisher who approached you with that, the irony, she wrote me afterward and said, oh, we saw your interview with all the, the, the Damagard, and on the basis of that interview, we're going to publish his book. But listen, I just want to salute her, her yeah. bravery. Oh, I, I don't know what happened, and uh, it's not for me to. Oh, to I'm, not, ha not I'm happy that uh, because I, I through that I've sorted out uh, whatever. There were some uh, some uh, things, quality things that was oh, not uh, up to standard. So thanks oh, to her, I fixed those. So I'm prepared for the next step. Oh, so oh, I, I, I don't okay, want to point so there, any. So so there, wasn't, no there, 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 there was nothing sinister behind it. I have no idea, and I can only, uh, I'm only grateful to her, so oh, I don't want to okay. point fingers at her okay, in any good. way. And if she was scared off, if that was the case, I can totally understand that, because it is, yeah. it is a scary business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're dealing with things that go up to the Queen of England, City of London Banking, yeah. the Vatican... And all, I can also all, all of these, uh, uh, you know, all of these institutions. I mean, this is an exactly backwards planet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. According to them, it's, and uh, when you say the queen, it is like some researchers have said that the killing of of Whitney Houston was actually a ritual sacrifice to the queen's jubilee that was coming up there. And if you see the the um, what do you call these big football. Uh, games, the sp uh, the football. Uh, you mean su Super Bowl? Super Bowl. If you see the year, uh, the last few years of the Super Bowl concerts of uh, where you want to call them, where Madonna and these other people have. If you know anything about Freemasonry, it's so loaded with Freemasonic symbols oh, and yeah. rituals, and it's unbelievable. Also, the Olympic Games. If you know anything oh, about, yeah. it was just. Like you sitting like, my God, they're really going for it now, aren't they? Yeah, so. it's going to be interesting to see the Sochi Olympics, uh, to see what, uh, how, how Putin has, has, has dealt with those, because supposedly he's not Masonic. We'll see. Mm. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Now, uh, there, there, there's another, um, another musician who I had the privilege of hearing when I attended the Woodstock conference, co concert. My God, you've been it, around, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually at the Woodstock concert. I, um, I, I was a Wall Street lawyer at the time, and, and a, f a friend of mine said, oh, we're driving up to the Woodstock. She, she lived across the street from me. I, 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 lived down, I, I lived down on Christopher Place in, in the village. And she said, oh, we're, we're, we're driving up to Woodstock with, 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 with the doors. Do you want to come? <coughs> you know? and I said, wow, this is going to be wild. So uh, some, some friends of ours and I drove up, and it was a, it was a mind-blowing experience. Uh, but 
Jimi Hendrix rendition of the Star Spangled Banner was like, it's dimensional. I mean, it just opens up dimensions. And, and he, he was such a, an extraordinary figure himself. And, and I just read about when, when he went to England and really opened up people there, the Jimi Hendrix experience, and it was in England that this occurred. So could, could you walk us through that, that whole um, event? <coughs> well, Jimmy was the first black musician that really came forward, the first black rock musicians, and he made an impact in the music world that was unheard of up to that part and uh, totally revolutionized music, I would say, especially when it came to the way of playing a guitar. <coughs> The tricky thing with Jimmy was that, once again, he was somebody that people suddenly started waking up to and started listening to, and he was looked upon as an icon, uh, really um, being listened to, not just being neglected. And one of the things, it's important to remember that this guy, he was very young, you know, he, he was one of, the guy, one of the people who died at the age of 27, many, many of these people in the uh, music scene has died at the age of 27. Why? I don't know, but they, they, they even have a, like the club of 27. And uh, Janis Joplin, who died just not even, a, uh, I think it was only two weeks after or three weeks after Jimmy, uh, she was also 27 from an overdose. When, when it comes to her death, I don't know anything that, except that it was an overdose. But uh, with Jimmy, the, the thing was that he, I, I can, I'm not sure who killed him, but what I know is that there was foul play involved. Uh, he was, uh, he was very aware of that he would not, uh, that he would die young. He, he told his friends that next time I'm going to go home to Seattle, I'm going to go in a pine box. And, and the, he was very aware that something was uh, going down. And one of the things I think that he, where he made a, a mistake, if you want to call it so, was that he started uh, being pro the Black Panther movement. And in these years, uh, you had Malcolm X, you had uh, other people like that. We're talking about e, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, and the whole FBI movement behind taking out these people. They were trying to stop them at any, at any uh, measure. But with, it's very easy to forget that the segregation in the States and, and the black population was at, totally, uh, it was almost, and, and people forget that. But this, these were the years where, where it really started to integrate. So, and people like J. Edgar Hoover hated that. They really tried to keep the white, uh, the white uh, flag high and, and pure, you know, didn't want any involvement with the black population at all. So somebody like Jimi Hendrix, who was also against the Vietnam War, which was going on, and he was, uh, like you say, with the Star Spangled Banner, and he was uh, burning his guitar after playing. He was just totally... Um, making people wake up to the fact that, you know, don't go to this madness, don't go to this war. There's other ways to deal with this. He was proclaiming a, a more violent way for the black population and so on. I think being young and not really understanding what he was getting himself into. But was, what happened was that uh, he was in London and the official story is that he was uh, with a... One of his uh, girlfriends, he had quite a few, a German lady by the name of Monica Dannemann, and that they had spent uh, a few days together, and that uh, in the evening uh, he uh, had taken some kind of uh, overdose. She went out to get some breakfast. I'm sorry, I'm a little tired at the moment, so the okay. details, if, if I'm a little blurry, I, ho I hope you're okay with that. Anyway, so he, she left the hotel room, and officially when she came back, he was dying or had died, you know, so she rang for the ambulance and they came, 
the ambulance people, they picked him up, drove him to the hospital, and they did, uh, they tried to re, what do you call him, the heart massage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these type of things, but he was dead, and, uh, and that was it. But when you look, so he died the official story but when you look into the uh, what witness has said and the autopsy and so on what the doctor said that when when he came to the hospital for one thing that the people in the uh, that drove the ambulance they say that Monica Danneman was not there that she was never there she says she came with the ambulance they say absolutely not they say they were called for he came to the room there was this, they didn't know that it was uh, Jimmy that was there. There was this, did, this black person that looked dead. They took him uh, to the hospital. And then when they tried to revive him, uh, the, as soon as they touched his, his chest, there was just uh, red wine coming out of his nose and mouth and, and so on. And the doctor has said categorically that this person, his lungs were filled with red wine that he was drowned in red wine. So how can, how can you do that? You can't drink yourself dead with red wine like that because the alcohol level uh, in his blood was very low. There was hard, so the, the body hadn't absorbed anything of the alcohol. So the thing is that somebody held him down and poured red wine. Maybe they even held his nose and just poured it down so that they, they filled his lungs with it and thus drowned him in red wine. This is how he died. So while the girlfriend went out, then they were watching his flat and they or, or the, the hotel room and they went in and assassinated him this way. There's a big question mark when it comes to this woman, Monica uh -huh. Donovan, because uh, it could also be that he fell asleep or she, she drugged him somehow. She went out, they went in, killed him, called the ambulance, the ambulance came, and that part of her alibi was that she would be in the ambulance, she was with him like a grieving um, a girlfriend and so on. So this, this is her story. Anyway, she made uh, Jimmy his, her whole career and life afterwards. Uh, you know, she, she did, did a lot of painting and she did a lot of interviews and so on, being, uh, be, becoming famous because of Jimmy. But then there was a court case where another of Jimmy's girlfriends were, I can't remember what they were fighting about, but Monica Danneman lost it. And then afterwards, two days afterwards, uh, when there was some question about her being called back to give testimony about Jimmy's death, she was found death, dead in a car in a garage with, uh, you know, filled with uh, exhaustion. So she, she died like that. And so, I can only right. say that when it comes to these things, people, witnesses or people who are somehow involved, they have a very bad habit of dying young. Yeah, yeah. So if she had been, uh, uh, you know, used as an accessory by the, by, by the assassins, then and uh, that could have been in, in Operation 40 also. I, th I totally agree with you. I, yeah. I'm, I'm g really going to look into that uh, area because since they have moved from country to country, I would not take it, uh, I, would be, I would not be surprised at all. Yeah. Because also it's important to know, to know that she died in, I think, 1991. That is uh, many years later. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, so no, no, why, no, yeah, why, sorry. why would they kill her? If she was killed, if it was not a suicide, why would she be killed after so many years? Because there's a there's a, one theory saying that uh, uh, that Jimmy was killed by his manager Mike Jeffries because uh, he had swindled him for money and so on. But Mike, Mike Jeffrey, he died in a plane crash where there were two officially two planes that collided midair over France. I mean, how big are the chances for that? You know, it sounds like a bad film script, you know. Yeah. So he, he went down there and then uh, she was killed some 20, 24 years later, yeah. whatever. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, it, it would seem that Jimi Hendrix's death was a, op, could, could have been an Operation 40, CIA Operation 40 assassination. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So we... It's like... 
It feels like the FBI, when you look at the FBI nowadays, uh, or I don't know if it's ever changed, but all the so-called terror acts, uh, the last 20 years, as yeah. far as I've been able to track out, it's been the FBI who has either trained, funded, supplied the so-called terror terrorists with weapons or whatever. So the, the FBI are deeply involved in these operations. And then the CIA have been taking care of them abroad. Yeah. But when the CIA have been, I mean, we're talking about rogue elements within these organizations as oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not pointing at fingers at everybody, no. but there's specific, very violent groupings in these uh, organizations that have been. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, no, no, right. So, so we're looking at John Lennon, Bob Marley, and Jimi Hendrix look like kind of classic CIA Operation Forty, right? Or yeah. No? Now, when we get to the case of Whitney Houston and the music industry, what have you discovered about what the assassination machine is like in the music industry and maybe in, in the other parts of the entertainment industry? Who, who, who is, because it's such an, an elaborate thing, they do these huge rituals around parties and dates and sales, Apple, Apple you know, Sony... Yeah. What, what are... I can only say that uh, I think there's more than you think, you know. I th when you look at uh, death like Nicole Smith, when you look at Amy Winehouse, when you yeah. look at other people like that in the... Now, not uh, long ago, uh, there was this... Um, what was his name? Walker. Uh, Pete, no, I can't remember. Yeah. Where the car just exploded. Yeah. You know, it really looked like it was hit by a drone missile. Yeah, yeah. I have not looked into it, but it, it, uh, I just know that in that whole business, I mean, they to get up to that level, it seems like they have to go through many of these rituals and, and get themselves involved in it. And once they're in there, there's no way out, you know. And I, I also know when it comes to the music business, I think it was in the early 1990s, um, there is, uh, I read one letter from a man in the music industry who was, uh, he was at that time, they were, uh, you know, it, it, the times were very optimistic. The whole music scene was like up and going, you know, with synth pop and all of these things. And everybody in the, in LA and so on were, were friends and doing great, you know, and enjoying it, at least according to this source that I'm, I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And then he, he said that one day uh, he got this invitation together with many other uh, leading people in the industry uh, to come to this uh, villa. Uh, they were invited there and uh, so he said, fine, why not? So he went there and there were, like I said, many of the other top people in the industry was invited. But he thought that he was going to see other people in the same uh, business. But instead, there were these business people that he, he had no idea who they were. They were very serious looking. There were bodyguards everywhere. They were, they were checked, you know, they were mm, uh, uh, frisked and everything on the way in. And when they came in, he thought it was such a weird uh, feeling inside, you know, that uh, the whole atmosphere was so strange. And one of the first things that they had to do was to sign a document that they would never tell anyone about this ever. Yeah. And uh, so one of the other, or one or two of the other people just said, I'm not going to do this. So they left. Fine. And he was almost going to do it, but he, he, he decided to stay anyway because he was curious. So he signed it. Anyway, what happened at this meeting was that the, this group of people what they never they never introduced themselves they just but he said you could feel that these were powerful people you didn't you don't mess around with them he said i don't if they were maf mafia whatever they were no idea but he said that they were represents for uh, the private jail systems and that part of their plan was to destabilize the american uh society to get uh, crimes and, and uh, violence up, 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 so that they could start filling the jails and make millions and millions from the more prisoners they got into these privately owned jails, the better. 
So they had decided to, to invite people, invite people from the music industry and launch a new type of music. What they launched was hip hop. And what they wanted to was for the music industry to start uh, pumping out uh, hip hop, especially black hip hop, the violent type of thing, gangster rap, this whole thing. And the, the source that I had, he said that after that, he couldn't believe his eyes because at that time everybody was just, uh, you know, laughing at rap and, and these things. I mean, that's not music. Somebody's talking in the background, just hip hop, hip hop. I mean, nobody took that seriously. But after that meeting, suddenly the, the whole music biz scene started going that way. And in, he said after that, the music videos, the, the lyrics, the, the, everything just went into gangster rap violence uh, uh, where they were started, you know, all these uh, drive-by shootings and killings and ritual killings and all of these. And these uh, rap stars and hip-hop artists started coming out with Freemasonry, jewelry, and all of this. He said the whole music scene just changed after that meeting. Do you, do, do you recall the uh, date of that meeting? I can find out. Okay. But I think it was 1991, but I'm not sure, but okay. I can find out. Okay. So I just think it's really important as well to see that one, one of the reasons when you look back in history and you see how the Iran-Contra scandal uh, where George Bush, Bill Clinton, um, these type of people were part of pumping out from MENA, Arkansas, pumping out uh, drugs big time, big time, big time into the states, into the main cities, into LA, to the cribs, to the gangs and so on, to get to destabilize society. At the same time, pumping in weapons, 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 so that the minorities would start killing each, other's, uh, each other off and, and so on, yeah. and also justify a much more militant police and so on. That also targeted the prison system and nowadays if you see in the in the states i mean you i mean you steal a bread of a, a loaf of bread and you're sentenced to like 80 years in prison or something like it's absolutely ridiculous you drive without a driver's license and you can be put away for 50 years and and what is that that is if you have a hotel and you want to secure a guest for the next 50 years, it's super if you can get someone in there. Because who's paying for these prisoners? We're back to the taxpayers. Yeah. It's the same story again. It's yeah. all the time the taxpayers. We are the ones who have to pay for it. And the money is going straight into the same elite. Yeah. Well, this, um, just on this, uh, would, would you be um, interested in doing a follow-on interview at some point? on the Bush Clinton crime of family. Bill Clinton, <laughs> Hillary Clinton. That is one, that Bush, is one major George H. Chapter. W. Bush. Okay, yeah. good. I I certainly would would like to do that. Um, we've we've come to the end of 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 this segment and and uh, I I I really want to uh, express my appreciation and respect for your work. Uh, because I know that it, it's gone in depth and has surfaced uh, uh, major revelations that go back to the events that have affected us all from the JFK assassination, RFK, all of Operation 40, mm. uh, uh, and we'll get more deeply into it. Once again, how can people uh, reach you and reach your work? My website is uh, www.lightonom and my book is called Coup d'etat in slow motion. That's only one. I've, I've had several books there. And like I say, donations or signing up for my newsletter, is, it's greatly appreciated. I cannot express how much I appreciate when people uh, help me because it's so hard to be on your own especially when when things like this it's just it's such a massive area yeah. to get into and i just want to say to finish off that my intention is not here to blame or, or spread fear or yeah. 
anything, my, my intention is to spread love and understanding and compassion in the world, to help us all unite again, to join hands and heal this beautiful, beautiful world that we've been given. It's meant to be a super place to live. And there's like a small group of people, like a school bully, bully that is just terrorizing the neighborhood. And it's up to us to let it stop because it only goes on because we allow it. They're like a few thousand, we are seven billions. It's an absolute joke. And I just want to finish with a beautiful prayer that uh, I have a yoga teacher. Uh, that she always finishes with this and it goes like this. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who heard us, be filled with peace and joy, love and light. Victory to that light. And this is what I want to do. I, I want us to embrace on the other side. We need to expose these things, total transparency, stand in honor side by side, embrace each other, Forgive people who have done us wrong. Look at us at ourselves in the mirror because we are not without guilt. We let this happen by us closing our eyes. We are part of these awful things that are happening because it is going on because we allow it. So it's time to stop it. Thank stop you. the madness. No, thank you. Thank you. And and Alfred, I'm so happy that to have been <laughs> honored to to come on your show again. So. Anytime you, you need much. me, I'm right here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.